please proceed to Franklin Hall, as our program will begin in 20 minutes.
please proceed to Franklin Hall, as our program will begin in 10 minutes.
Please take your seats as our program will begin in five minutes.
we kindly ask that you silence all electronic devices as our program is about to begin. Thank you. Please take your seats. Our program is about to begin. Thank you. I think I just grew up in a household where science was valued and where curiosity was uh, encouraged. So science is kind of a natural choice. My interest in the out of doors and probably therefore into science did come from camping and especially visiting national parks with my family when I was a kid. I used to like to make bombs, actually. That's more common in scientists than you might actually think. I made nitroglycerin. Uh, it was pretty stupid, actually. It was a good thing we didn't blow each other up. I actually shot my sister with a rocket launcher a few times, so I got in a little bit of trouble with that sometimes, yes. I suppose I was sort of a geek and that I was interested in a lot of things like amateur radio, building model airplanes, building model rockets. The rockets got large. Our real fear in that case, of course, was it would come down on a cow and we'd have to pay for that cow. That started off generally with taking things apart and not being able to put them back together. It was initially bicycles, taking apart the VMX and the wheels and the chains and everything. And then all of a sudden the brakes didn't work anymore. You know, I was very ambitious about uh, pushing the limits of writing great software, making software that uh, did things that had never been done before. And you know, that became my obsession from age 13. I never really considered seriously being other than a scientist or engineer. They were the ones who understood the world. Please welcome our Master of Ceremonies, the Franklin Institute's Chief Astronomer, Derek Pitts.
Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Franklin Institute Awards Ceremony. This has been an exciting couple of weeks at the Institute. Last Wednesday, the museum was featured in the award-winning ABC sitcom, Abbott Elementary. I know you all wanted me to be in the episode, but we'll take care of that next season. <laughs> During the season finale, young students visited the Franklin Institute for a highly anticipated field trip that showcased the giant heart and the Baldwin 60,000 steam locomotive. And this week, we gather for our biggest event of the year, celebrating STEM professionals and business leaders, many of whom recall their imaginations being first sparked by science while still children. It's my pleasure to be serving as your Master of Ceremonies as we pay tribute to the visionary work of this year's nine laureates. On behalf of all of us at the Franklin Institute, I thank you for being here, and I offer heartfelt congratulations to our laureates. Each is a trailblazer, leaving an indelible mark on the world with advancements in science, technology, and industry that have transformed our lives as we know them, and which lay the groundwork for our future. These nine join an exclusive community of scientists, engineers, inventors, and business leaders dating back 199 years. Think about that for a moment, 199 years. Past award recipients include Albert Einstein, Thomas Edison, Marie Curie, Nikola Tesla, Jane Goodall, and many, many more, including those who have joined us tonight for this very special occasion. And now, we welcome to the stage the 2023 Franklin Institute laureates escorted by their sponsors. Kenneth C. Frazier, escorted by Michael Usain. <laughs> Elaine Fuchs, escorted by Nancy Bonini. Deb Niemeyer, escorted by Bridget Wadzik. <laughs> Philip Kim, escorted by Torney Gustafsson. Nader Ngeta, escorted by Ahmad Horfar. R. Lawrence Edwards, escorted by John Waymiller. Barbara H. Liskov, escorted by Mitchell Marcus. Richard N. Zare, escorted by Joseph Francisco. Monica Schleyer-Smith, 
escorted by Larry Gladney. And introducing Chair of the Franklin Institute Board of Trustees, Thomas J. Lynch, and the Franklin Institute President and CEO, Larry Dubinsky. We begin with the Benjamin Franklin Next Gen Award, which debuted two years ago to recognize an investigator in the early phase of their career. This award commends an exceptional cutting edge discovery, invention, or development in science or engineering. With this award, the Institute has even greater opportunity to honor achievements that spark innovations in science and technology. It's actually one of the most counterintuitive phenomena in physics. Two atoms bonded across time and space. Touch one and the other responds. Driven to understand these dynamics, Monica Schleyer-Smith is pushing the limits of quantum entanglement with research that may have monumental implications for a new generation of computers. Imagine flipping a coin here at the Franklin Institute. Heads. A half mile away at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, your friend has done the same. You call to compare notes. Tails. It happens every time. Whatever your result, your friend's is the opposite. No matter where your friend goes. Chicago. Nairobi. The moon. This is the strange reality of quantum entanglement. A phenomenon by which atoms, not coins, develop a mysterious connection that seems to transcend time and space. And in a lab at Stanford University, Monica Schleyer-Smith is harnessing that connection to uncover secrets of the universe and clear the way for extraordinary future technology. I think of myself as curious and somebody who's adventurous, kind of likes to explore. If I'm out trail running, I like to sort of explore some unknown path and see where it leads, and that's certainly something I do in my research as well. I'm an experimental physicist, and so I have a lab full of lasers and electronic equipment. And what we're doing with that is we actually use these lasers to cool atoms to millionths of a degree above absolute zero in temperature. But it's when she entangles those atoms with special laser light that Schleyer-Smith truly turns off the beaten trail. Atoms aren't all the same. They can each take on what you might think of as a personality, even opposite ones like this regular hydrogen atom and its alter ego, the same hydrogen atom with a goatee. Entangled, they become like the coins from before, each tumbling in a state of indecision. Only when we snatch one and look at it, does it randomly decide which version it is, and the other instantly becomes the opposite, no matter how far away. Poke an entangled atom in New York, its partner in London reacts. It's mind-boggling stuff. And Schleyer-Smith is pushing boundaries, forging these mysterious connections across large numbers of atoms at once, creating whole networks, in fact. You can imagine this might be used to create unparalleled new sensor technology. Touching just one entangled atom in the sensor simultaneously affects the others. So I play violin, string quartets. I think that music is something that is, in some sense, science, like patterns are a big part of music and patterns are a big part of math and physics. But also it's a way to sort of take my mind somewhere else. And often when you take your mind somewhere else, that's where you get new ideas. And those very ideas spark questions about the nature of gravity, debates about the shape of the universe, and a potential revolution in computing. Imagine the coins in this sorting machine represent a stream of information flowing through an average computer today. The CPU processes one coin at a time, heads or tails, one or zero, a single bit, but entangling each coin with many others could allow a future computer to do operations on all entangled coins in a set simultaneously. Processing hundreds, maybe thousands of information streams at a time, Schleyer-Smith might just be laying the groundwork for a giant leap forward in quantum computing. 
I heard a distinguished colleague of mine say, she said, people always told me that I think outside the box, but I never knew where the box was. I thought that was a really uh, nice epitome of um, kind of this notion that one should maintain that childlike sense of playfulness, openness to possibilities, not letting people tell you where the boundaries are um, in pursuing science. The recipient of the Benjamin Franklin Next Gen Award, Monica Schleyer Smith. Thank you, Dr. Schleyer. Smith will keep the award safe for you until the end. <laughs> it's now my pleasure to introduce a longtime passionate Franklin Institute supporter, newly elected Board of Trustees Chair, Tom Lynch. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us at this incredible event. It's quite amazing. This is my first awards after being elected chair of the Institute's board, and it's thrilling, humbling, and nerve-wracking <laughs> to stand on this stage with all these amazing people. And I'd like to start by giving special thanks to Marshall Perlman and Dr. Don Morrell. Uh, they were the Institute's prior chairs for the past 20 years. I mean, it's amazing. They provided extraordinary leadership to help the Institute navigate the largest expansion in its history, a global pandemic, and so much more. And they worked with the leadership team to develop the most far-reaching strategic plan in our history. It's a really exciting time here at the Franklin Institute, and you're going to hear more about our plans later in the evening, and I think you'll really be uh, excited. Now, I've been honored to have leadership roles in my career as a CEO and now chairman of TE Connectivity and in a major, somewhat unexpected shift in my career after I retired as CEO, I became the president of my high school alma mater, Conwaligan Catholic in Fairleth Hills, and we have some alums here tonight. Um, and I learned a lot in those roles, but especially that we really need to do more to support STEM education. Uh, there's just not enough technically technical talent. We're not, we're not helping them enough. But the good news is, this is the wheelhouse of the Franklin Institute. There's really no place like the Institute that ignites the imagination and sparks curiosity in the world around us. It happens every day in this building for families and students. It happens across Philadelphia, the region, and the nation with education programs and through great digital programs like Derek's Guide to the Cosmos. Um, in other words, you get inspiration 24-7 anywhere in the world from this great place. And of course, on top of all this, next year the Franklin Institute will be 200 years old, established in the honor of America's original innovator. This organization has been inspiring science and learning since 1824. It's hard to wrap your head around that. Um, but it's lasted two centuries because it continues to reinvent itself. And our current plans for transforming the museum ensure that the Franklin Institute will ignite imagination like never before. I love that phrase. Tonight you will hear the stories of amazing people who had their imaginations ignited when they were young, and they went on to change the world, literally. So thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting the Institute's mission to ignite a passion for science and technology and really, really enjoy this evening. I know you will. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. The Institute's ability to ignite imaginations and spark curiosity is indeed what we do every day. And tonight is no different. As we celebrate our laureates, we hope that their personal stories will be an inspiration to each of you. Before I announce the next three laureates, 
I'd like to acknowledge the hard work of the committees responsible for identifying and selecting our award winners each year. The Committee on Science and the Arts, chaired by Dr. Donald Silberberg of the University of Pennsylvania. The Bauer Business Awards Selection Committee, chaired by Dr. Michael Useem of the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and the International Selection Committee for the Bauer Award for Achievement in Science, chaired by Institute Trustee Dr. Paul Offit of the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania and the University of Pennsylvania. It's due to their diligence and commitment to a selection process that can take years to complete that we're able to celebrate the individuals on stage. Please join me in thanking our committee members for their dedication to preserving and advancing the legacy of the awards program. <laughs> Despite irrefutable evidence for the existence of atoms and molecules, when Richard Zare began working with lasers in the 1970s, they still hadn't been seen. With a lot of ingenuity and a little laser light, Zare illuminated the building blocks of matter, forever changing chemistry in the process. He's been called a scientific hero, one of the most creative and original thinkers of our era. Who would guess that Richard Zare's 50-year career as a world-renowned theoretical and experimental chemist started with a preschool prank played on his dad? My first adventures in chemistry, probably was about age four, I urinated into his aquarium that contained tropical fish. And this ended up killing the tropical fish. I was immediately impressed by the power of chemistry. While his father wasn't quite as pleased by the deadly discovery, the consequences of this experiment changed the course of young Richard's life and modern chemistry. I was fortunate, I grew up at the time when the laser was invented, first discovered, and no one knew what to do with it. <laughs> Physicists called the laser a solution in search of a problem. Zare knew the problem. In the 1960s, in his lab at the University of Colorado, he was studying exactly how chemical reactions worked. But Zare ran into a problem that had plagued chemists for decades. Molecules and atoms are too small to see. Chemistry was a bit of a guessing game. So molecules aren't that big, so I can't see them by eye. However, I can do something to them to make them so you can see them. One of the things I can do is I can excite them with a laser and make them fluoresce. Fluoresce, to glow. Laser-induced fluorescence, or LIF, excites molecules with a laser beam and then measures the light they give off, each molecule having a unique fingerprint of color. With a self-built laser, Zare ignited a revolution. We could see things at a level that had not been possible to be seen before. And it certainly made one believe in the atomistic and molecular picture, because you can't see them with your eye, but you could certainly see the fluorescence. Suddenly, we could actually see the shapes of molecules, witness their evolutions as chemical reactions unfolded in Zare's laser light. We would actually, I think, be the first people to actually see a single molecule at room temperature in a liquid actually fluoresce and detect it. And so I was excited about those possibilities. And those possibilities seemed endless. Zara's motto, once you have a hammer, everything begins to look like a nail. Over the decades, LIF has been used to discover petroleum leaks in the ocean floor, detect cancer, reduce carbon emissions, determine the age of ancient artifacts, designed new green chemical processes, and even led to one of the greatest achievements of the 20th century, the sequencing of the human genome. I actually think a, a good scientist who believes and disbelieves at the same time, you gotta believe and put forward an idea why something is happening. And after you put forward that idea, you gotta turn around and say, is that really so? And is that true? And question it, trying to understand why things are the way they are a belief really that there, there can be an explanation for what you're seeing. You often don't understand the power of the question. It's actually more important than the answer. The recipient of the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Chemistry, Richard N. Zare.
with the proliferation of early computers into businesses came a crisis of coding that threatened to stop the revolution in its tracks. Thanks to Barbara Liskoff, a new way of programming has opened the gates for nearly every modern software application we use today. I grew up in San Francisco. I went to public school. I was always interested in math and science. And in my family, it was important to do well in school and it was expected that I would go to college. But at that time, it wasn't something girls were supposed to do. Back in the 1960s, girls weren't supposed to fiddle with computers either, but Barbara Liskoff did and wound up utterly transforming the way software is written, leaving a mark on nearly every single program and app we use today. With an undergraduate math degree from Berkeley, Liskoff took a job at the MITRE Corporation in the new field of computer programming. I knew nothing about programming. I had no background. Teaching herself to code by reading computer manuals, Liskoff grew into something of a prodigy over the years, earning a PhD at Stanford and eventually returning to MITRE as storm clouds gathered over a fledgling software industry. Then they asked me to look into the software crisis. And the software crisis was people didn't know how to build software systems that worked. In the 1970s, as hardware grew more capable and companies attempted to create bigger, more complicated programs, software began to fail in spectacular fashion. You would pick up the newspaper in those days and in the business section, you'd see an article about a company that had spent millions of dollars, hundreds of man years. They always talked about man years. And in the end, they had a product they had to throw out because it simply didn't work. Imagine a program that simulates a car, 30,000 parts, all working together. For each one, a few dozen lines of mathematical description. For every function, equations for calculating motion and energy. In the era of the software crisis, all computer programs, even the most complex, would be written like this, in a single document, sometimes with hundreds of thousands of internal cross-references. Programs failed because they were simply too convoluted to follow. Collaboration was almost impossible. Liskoff's answer was Clue, a new programming language that cleaned up the mess. Solving enormous technical challenges, she cleared the way for code like this to be structured across many documents. Specialization across teams was suddenly possible. A single document describes the accelerator, several for the engine, and unnecessary details could be hidden away. The rest would come together in an easy to read master document. Succeeding where others hadn't, Liskoff unleashed a brand new field of software design and became the first female professor of computer science at MIT. As Liskoff's technique became standard, the software crisis of the 1970s lifted. Programs became easier to write and understand, and the modularity allowed for an accumulation of knowledge that increasingly accelerates software development projects to this very day. The concepts Liskoff proved with Clue became the foundation of nearly every program ever written since. When you design a programming language, it has to be well-defined. It has to be easy to use. It has to have all the features people need. It has to also be relatively easy to understand. Sometimes you have to invent something new. The recipient of the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Computer and Cognitive Science, Barbara H. Liskoff. With carbon dating, scientists create glimpses of the past with remarkable accuracy. But its 50,000-year range wasn't long enough for Larry Edwards. Opening a window into Earth's long climate history required an innovation with profound implications for the future. 
I love the out of doors. That's sort of how I got involved in this business in the first place. I was working actually for the National Park Service at Voyagers National Park in Northern Minnesota. And at the time, there was this elderly man called Bill Haithman who figured out how to build birch bark canoes in a traditional way. And so I would drive down on my weekends and learn from Bill. The Minnesota wilderness taught Larry Edwards what school couldn't. Patience, resourcefulness, being in tune with surroundings, everything a geochemist would need to make history. My father, as he got older, he used to say, well, rowing is like getting old. You look back, but you pull forward. Raised in a biracial, multicultural family in Boston, Edwards grew up with broad interests, art, medicine, but it was earth science that won in the end. With a PhD in geochemistry from Caltech, Edwards set his sights on the greatest threat to the forests of Minnesota, climate change. Understanding climate change meant Edwards needed a way to see far back into climate history, to a time long before humans began to influence it. Carbon dating, the standard method of timestamping geological samples, could look back about 50,000 years. But Edwards wanted to go farther, to understand the impact of ice ages and other long-term climate cycles. Just imagine, albeit in the natural environment, if you were to have the last million years of time at your disposal, what you might see. The solution came from space. The memory of an old project studying meteorites inspired Edwards to investigate a rare form of uranium that would, at a known rate, decay into an element called thorium. And so the methods I developed are 100,000 times more sensitive than the previous method. So all of a sudden, you had the possibility of getting very, very precise timelines to all of these events in the past. With uranium-thorium dating, Edwards revolutionized our view of Earth's climate system, making it possible to look back an incredible 700,000 years. Edwards turned his new technique on fossilized coral, uncovering patterns connecting sea level rise to the timing of the ice ages. Next, he went underground, applying his methods to stalagmites, which record evidence of climate events as they grow over hundreds of thousands of years. We've got this incredible record of the coming and going of monsoon rainfall in China over this time period, decade by decade. With this remarkable ability to reconstruct history with such precision and accuracy, Edwards found a pattern linking weather events to major cultural shifts. An 11th century wet period marked the golden age of the Northern Song Dynasty in China, while a relentless drought six centuries later ended the Ming Dynasty. Edwards's groundbreaking methods give us a new perspective as we look back on human history. And his work is proving critical to understanding the global climate emergency as we look forward. One thing that I really get excited about is how things work. How does the earth work? How is it that we can get climate and time out of this little deposit in a cave? And we can put that in perspective of what we're seeing now and what we're predicting for the future. of the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Earth and Environmental Science, R. Lawrence Edwards. Good evening. Heather and I are honored to be here with you as co-chairs of the Franklin Institute Award Ceremony and Dinner. It's a joy to gather in celebration of this year's laureates, whose inspiring stories and trailblazing work will stay with us long after this night is over. We would like to thank our 2023 Vice Chairs, Jim Dever and Dr. Lynn Dever, and the awards corporate and friends committees for their dedication and leadership. And to each one of you here this evening, Thank you for your presence and support. The proceeds from this night sustain the important work of the Institute to inspire moments of discovery with Family Foundation, Morgan Lewis, Marsha and Jeffrey Perlman, and UST Global. Additionally, we offer our thanks to this year's awards patron sponsors, whose names you will see on screen. 
It's with gratitude that we acknowledge the generosity of all our sponsors and supporters, and a full list can be found in your program book. Finally, tonight would not be possible without the longstanding and generous support of Bank of America, the presenting sponsor of the award ceremony and dinner. We are thankful for 21 years of leadership and support. I would now like to welcome to the stage a loyal champion of the Franklin Institute, President of Bank of America, Greater Philadelphia, Jim Dever. Thank you. On behalf of Bank of America, it is my pleasure to celebrate the 2023 Class of Franklin Institute laureates with you. Bank of America has supported the Franklin Institute Awards because we strongly believe in the Institute's mission and are greatly to play a part in celebrating the incredible work of this year's awardees, as well as bolster the Institute's work to inspire and educate. This year marks Bank of America's 21st consecutive year of partnering with the Franklin Institute for this event and what a special partnership it has been. Like the Institute, Bank of America has a long history of working across Philadelphia and the nation to help people realize their dreams and positively shape their communities. We've seen the power of investing in our communities to ensure all Philadelphians are set up for success from pr promoting economic mobility through job initiatives and improving racial equity. We continue to look for new ways to meet the needs of our neighbors and help create lasting change. As the Institute approaches its 200th anniversary in 2024, we are excited to see how the Institute will set the standard for science centers around the globe. My wife, Lynn, and I are thrilled to co-chair next year's milestone event. This historic ceremony is just one of the many ways the Institute promotes the power of science, technology, business, collaboration, and innovation. On behalf of all of our employees and clients at Bank of America, I thank you for joining us and I offer our heartfelt congratulations to all of the wonderful laureates. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. For Nader and Geta, the future is powered by light. The feats of engineering in Engeta's lab cast aside electronic circuits for mazes of light waves that do the work of modern electronics faster and in infinitely smaller forms. This is the ENIAC, the world's first digital computer. At 30 tons, it filled an entire room at the University of Pennsylvania, where a section of it is on display today. This small electronic plaque can tell you more about it. It's arguably two billion times faster than the ENIAC. That may sound like an impressive leap forward in computing, and it absolutely is, but Nader and Geta is forging a path toward what may turn out to be an even greater one. I was born and raised in Iran. As a child, I was always interested and curious to find out how things work. When I was in high school, one of my older brothers was working on a battery-operated transistor radio, and I asked him, how does this gadget work without being connected to anything? The radio waves his brother spoke of would capture and get his imagination. They make up a tiny part of an entire spectrum of which only a fraction is visible, light. And Geta came to the US in 1978 from the University of Tehran, determined to engineer devices powered not by electricity, but by light waves. In order to achieve a new and interesting functionality, we need to manipulate and control waves. And for that, we need materials. Light tends to travel in a straight line. Engineering light-powered devices requires materials that can alter the direction of light, the way wires and circuits guide the path of electricity. And Geta became a pioneer in engineering metamaterials. These don't occur naturally, but can be manipulated to guide packets of light, very loosely speaking, the way bumpers in a pinball machine guide the direction of a ball. 
You can imagine arranging bumpers so that photons bounce around an obstacle, which Ingeta did in 2005, inventing a cloaking device that could shield objects from certain forms of light and interference. He later used the same principles to create a type of nanoscale circuitry, the same components you might find inside modern electronics, but infinitely smaller, powered not by electricity, but light. One of the interesting aspects of scientific process is serendipity. Often it happens when you're working on a project, you may discover something that uh, you have not been looking for, and that will actually put you in a very interesting direction. With a burgeoning toolbox of light manipulating inventions at hand, and get a wonder, what if he could harness his know-how and build a device that could supersede one of the most disruptive innovations in modern times? This is a metamaterial photonic processor, scaled up for prototyping purposes. In practice, it would occupy only a minuscule region on a computer chip, one of thousands like it. A pattern of light waves enters the metamaterial maze, structures fine-tuned to solve a given equation. The solution comes almost instantly, entirely at the speed of light. A paradigm-shifting computing platform that can handle large amounts of data using very high speed, small volume, and low power, and parallel processing will be crucially needed. And I believe this computing platform can address that need. Computers so fast, small, and efficient would be bound only by the size of the interface needed for us to run them, sparking another evolution in computing that could relegate the fastest devices we have today to the history books. I love light. I love waves. When you are in love and you are passionate about the topics that you are working on and you ask curiosity-driven questions like what if question, why not question. When you are passionate and you are in love with the subject, you'll do great and be courageous in doing new things. The recipient of the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Electrical Engineering, Nader Engeda. In science, some of the biggest strides forward come from those unafraid to pursue intuition. The momentous discoveries in Philip Kim's lab are opening new frontiers in material science that will impact a broad range of fields such as engineering, construction, and electronics. Can an ordinary material become extraordinary simply by cutting it? Yeah, that is a crazy study I ever had. <laughs> Whittled down to the smallest possible slivers, what was brittle gained super strength, becomes more conductive than gold. Physicist Philip Kim's colleagues were skeptical. Certainly without that courage, that just challenging yourself to some of this most uh, bold idea that innovation will not happen. In more ways than one, the laws of physics took Korean-born scientist Philip Kim from the University of Seoul to Harvard and then to Columbia University for his first faculty position. Kim's grandfather had tried to become a physicist, his father next. Both times, history got in the way. At the turn of the millennium, the young material scientist was drawn by the promise of theoretical two-dimensional materials. Sliver is exactly one atom thick, too fine a cut for any knife. Yet according to the theories of the time, limited to interacting in just two dimensions, length and width, atoms behave differently. Some everyday materials gain incredible properties. Kim had his eye on the black flaky stuff at the point of a pencil. Graphite would become graphene, one of the strongest materials in existence, 200 times harder than steel, more flexible than rubber, lighter than aluminum and transparent, also the thinnest material known to man one million times thinner than a human hair. And yet a single sheet could hold the weight of a full-sized SUV. And Kim suspected there was even more to it. He prepped his lab, committed himself to graphene, beginning research that would take years. Name one thing on your personal bucket list. I want to take the one week completely off, <laughs> complete, completely off from my email, from my all the duty, and just, um, do nothing. <laughs> what happened that Sunday? <laughs> Kim's 
Humans have been using graphite since the Stone Age, but Kim was one of the first to shine a laser on it. Sooner or later, we start to kind of find the very unusual properties of this graphene. It turns out graphene conducts electricity better than any other known material. In 2005, Kim's research revealed the mind-bending ways this happens, igniting a storm of innovation now shaping the future of electronics. Paper-thin graphene displays, batteries that charge your cell phone in seconds or electric car in minutes, solar cells better at producing and storing energy even when it's raining. But the possibilities of 2D materials don't end with graphene. In principle, you can just bring the another 2D materials on the top of them, and you can just restack them together. Today, in his lab at Harvard, Kim is layering them, stacking the single atom sheets like pancakes, laying foundations for new forms of computer memory, circuitry, and potentially even medical sensors powered by magnetic fields. If you just kind of choose the material right and engineer it in the right way, you get this kind of synergy of the, these two different, completely different properties, which can lead into the quite unusual properties we never expected. I think that's kind of some of the interesting part. It's not just fulfilling the esoteric curiosity of the scientists, but also it can benefit mankind, the humankind, by just kind of developing some of the applications based on these new discoveries that we can make out of this system. The recipient of the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Physics Philip Kim. Emissions in our cities accumulate in some neighborhoods while sparing others. Addressing this inequity in access to clean air takes compassion, groundbreaking science, and the unwavering dedication of Deb Niemeyer. Sitting in a classroom in El Paso, Texas, a young Deb Niemeyer looks out the window at a low-hanging cloud on the other side of the river in Mexico. Guessing it must be coming from the brick factory in her town, she asks herself, why is the cloud there, but not here? Finding the answer will take a strong education in civil engineering and one of the largest scientific studies of emissions in history. Our communities are shaped by civil engineers, designers of the built environment, infrastructure like dams, bridges, roadway networks, parks, I have a three degrees in civil engineering, but I am not a typical civil engineer. <laughs> She's also a photographer, hiker, world traveler, educator, and mother to several humans, multiple cats, and a golden retriever sidekick named Pilot. I also had a grandfather. He was a major general in the Air Force, and he was pretty clear that no matter what we thought our life was, we were privileged and we owed back. Niemeyer's chance would come in the mid-1990s. She'd taken a position at the University of California, Davis, just as concerns about rising vehicle emissions opened up research opportunities in the state. Recalling the cloud of smog she'd once seen drifting from El Paso across the river, she wondered, is there something in our infrastructure causing it? Niemeyer launched one of the most ambitious studies of emissions and city planning ever conducted, collecting mountains of health data from all kinds of urban communities in the U.S. Recruiting participants from across the economic spectrum, she fit tailpipes with measuring equipment, tracking emissions and driving habits with meticulous attention to detail. Accounting for all the mounting variables, Niemeyer's 15-year-long study of emissions and health painted a picture of cities divided along economic lines. Poor air quality and consequential health crises were rampant in low-income areas. The problem was multifaceted, from limited access to cleaner vehicles, to locations often in lower-lying areas, to city planning practices that put green spaces in higher-earning areas and highways through lower-earning ones. In congested low-income neighborhoods, like the area of Juarez across the border from El Paso, emissions become trapped. As the smog thickens, health problems arise. And city infrastructure makes the challenges difficult to address within these communities. They can be really far from health clinics, and that distance makes you think twice about driving to get 
health care sooner. For those working multiple low-paying jobs a day, a two-hour bus trip to the doctor's office simply isn't feasible. And what we found is, in every case, communities who had less access suffered more. And those structures, those, those elements we used in our infrastructure were all things that have been in place for a very long time. Niemeyer's study sparked a movement of change. It directly influenced regulations in California intended to clean up the air and lift the smog over its cities. Today, her work shapes federal policy on emissions. That is my science motto, that do good has both a recipient and a giver, and that we're really good at the giver part, we're pretty bad at the recipient part. To evolve, you have to be able to understand both what you can give to a community in engineering and what the community wants from us as engineers. Math and science isn't enough. It's not enough to be a good mathematician and a good scientist. You need to understand how the world works. The recipient of the Bauer Award and Prize for Achievement in Science, Deb Niemeyer. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to welcome to the stage a longtime friend of the Institute, the 48th Governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro. Good evening, everyone. It is indeed an honor to be here with you at the great Franklin Institute. And I want to begin by thanking my friend Greg Devins for inviting me here tonight, for following up over and over again to make sure I'd be here tonight. And most importantly, not just for his great work at IBC, but his commitment to the community outside the walls of IBC and being the great civic leader that he is, having served on my transition team and now doing great work, of course, all across Philadelphia and our Commonwealth. Greg, thank you so much for your leadership. And I want to recognize uh, two outstanding public servants who are with us, who are dedicating their time to being with us here tonight. State Senator Ryan Almond and State Representative Joe Hogan. I want to thank them for their leadership and for being here tonight. Thank you, guys. And of course, on behalf of the 13 million people here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I want to congratulate our nine honorees for their outstanding achievements. For 199 years, the Franklin Institute Awards have recognized the scientists, the thinkers, and the leaders who push boundaries of what is possible and who work every day to build a better future, not just for themselves, but for the rest of us. Tonight's honorees will add to that history from advancements in how we understand our climate to life-saving research on diseases and medicine. I want to say a special congratulations to my friend Ken Frazier, who in a moment will receive his award. I want to thank you for dedicating your life's work to innovation, to crafting opportunity for so many who are oftentimes left behind, and for not just breaking barriers for yourself, but for inspiring others to go out and break barriers themselves. I'm especially thankful for Ken's leadership on the 110 Project, a commitment to hire 10 million black people without a college degree in this decade. And I want you to know I want you to know that Ken is inspiring a lot of action, including in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, 
On my first day in office, I signed an executive order making 92 percent or 65,000 state government jobs no longer requiring a college degree. Ken, you're inspiring change. Thank you very much for your leadership. But I wanted to be here tonight not just to celebrate Ken and the other honorees, not just to single out their individual achievements, but to emphasize the collective work that we must all do to make sure that the next discoveries are made possible by supporting STEM education and by creating real opportunity for the next generation of leaders who will ultimately sit on this stage. It's fitting that we honor those who are building our futures right here at the Franklin Institute, where so many children are inspired every single day to be the next scientist, to be the next creator. You see, this is a place that was built not just to educate our kids, but to engage them, to get them excited, to help them see the world around them just a little bit different a place where kids can come and dream, a place where kids can come and be kids. I want to thank Larry Dubinsky and the team here at the Franklin Institute for giving our children that opportunity to dream and learn and grow. Larry, thank you so much for all you do. You see, Walking through that giant heart over there not only teaches our kids about science, but it builds memories that will last a lifetime. That excitement when you're traversing through the little hallway there. I still remember what that felt like when I was brought here as a kid by my parents on the school trips. I remember what it felt like the first time I climbed up. And then I remember coming back the next time and being like the veteran who could show my little brother around. I also remember what it was like when I brought our four children here as a parent. That's a special feeling. It can't be replicated anywhere else. It's a place here at the Franklin Institute that opens up our eyes. And we need to make sure that all God's children have the opportunity to have their eyes open through not just visiting the great Franklin Institute, but for having the opportunity to learn STEM education, to figure out how to apply what they can learn there in incredible ways that will help advance our world. We need to work together to empower our children, to give them the real freedom to chart their own course and the opportunity to succeed the opportunity for them to see in themselves the ability to be Ken and Elaine and Philip and Richard and Monica and Deb and Lawrence and Nader and Barbara to see possibility in themselves. We need to live in a commonwealth where there aren't limits placed on our children, where there's no limits because of maybe what they look like or what zip code they're growing up in where government doesn't inhibit their growth and their opportunity, but instead invests in it, believes in the next generation, gives them the kind of excitement every day of their lives that they feel when they're here at the Franklin Institute. It's why as governor in my first budget, we're investing in STEM education. We're investing in public education. We're investing in opportunities in communities that have for too long been forgotten. It's an honor to be with you all here tonight, celebrating the leaders in science and innovation at the oldest institute of its kind in our nation. These honorees, they're trailblazers, they're leaders. They're the people who look at the heights of human achievement and say, what comes next? That's the kind of feeling we need to have every day here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, where we don't ever feel like there are boundaries to our opportunity, where there are limits to our freedom, where we can give everybody the ability to have the freedom to chart their own course and the opportunity to succeed. And so I would say to each of these honorees here tonight who have inspired others along the way, thank you for your work. 
Thank you for making a difference here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We are all proud of you. And through you, we are inspired to act for the next generation. Your, your compassion, your curiosity, your interest, it's infectious in our community. And I mean infectious in the good way, not in the <laughs> bad way. And I think what you also speak to is what I see every day when I travel across this Commonwealth. The enormous potential of Pennsylvania. The enormous potential of Pennsylvanians. You're the best of the best. And I hope that as you leave here tonight with these beautiful medals around your necks, that you recognize just how much we appreciate you and what you have meant to so many others along the way. Thank you for doing this work. To all of you, thank you for letting them do this work and for giving me an opportunity to do this work. And when you leave here tonight, don't just leave here feeling as though you enjoyed a wonderfully elegant celebration in this beautiful grand hall. Leave here tonight inspired for you to be able to go out and make change, for you to be able to go out and see the potential in all of God's children for you to leave here tonight with the courage to go out and make a difference in our communities. Thank you so much for all uh, that you do. Thank you to the Franklin Institute for housing us here and for inspiring change and excitement in our communities. And thank you to these honorees for all of your incredible work. We appreciate you. Thank you all. God bless. Thank you. Now that's a tough act to follow, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Governor Shapiro. The Institute is proud to be an invaluable education partner with the Commonwealth, and thank you so much for your service. Friends, it is an honor to be here with you for another award ceremony that celebrates the brightest minds in science, technology, engineering, and business. I want to echo Derek's sentiments of gratitude for the many individuals involved in the award ceremony and dinner. I want to acknowledge the Institute's Board of Trustees. Their insight, encouragement, and generosity are key to this Institute's success this day and every day. I would like to recognize Chris Franklin, who has agreed to chair the Institute's Master Plan Campaign. Thank you, Chris. We have already heard from Heather Bittenbender and Greg Devins, but I'd like to personally recognize their efforts and the efforts of our vice chairs, Lynn and Jim Dever. Thank you. Also, Jim, thank you and Bank of America for more than two decades of generous, generous support. You and your colleagues, including Franklin Institute trustee Rob McMiniman and Debbie O'Brien, our tremendous partners. <laughs> Finally, my thanks to each of you for your presence here tonight. Your commitment and generosity are at the heart of our ability to inspire and educate more than one million people annually through our digital initiatives, through the exhibits in this historic building and through educational programs that reach across the region and around the nation. Thank you. The Franklin Institute is the most visited museum in Pennsylvania, a national leader in STEM education and a tourism driver, generating more than $150 million in economic impact annually. 
Over the past decade, we've welcomed more than eight and a half million visitors. Among those visitors are millions of students who attend for free or with deeply discounted field trips. And those visits are impactful. Millions more students will visit the Institute in the decade ahead. And as we prepare to celebrate our bicentennial in 2024, the Institute is set to transform our Science Center to be better able to meet the needs of our community. We're calling this plan for the future Mission Wow. We are developing next generation experiences that demonstrate the importance of science, technology, engineering, and math in our everyday lives and build 21st century skills. The work we are doing is imperative. In the coming years, tens of millions of new jobs in science and technology will be created. These jobs have the potential to improve the economic horizons of so many young people. But in many cases, our youth are not prepared to succeed and our schools cannot do it alone. The Institute is uniquely positioned to take on this challenge. With our core mission of education and inspiration, the Institute works within our walls and across the nation, in libraries and community centers, and with out-of-school time partners to train educators and engage students, especially those from underrepresented communities. In just a matter of weeks, construction will begin on the very first Mission WOW project, a new two-story space science exhibit that will open this November. We are grateful to the Boeing Company for their $3 million investment that combined with the generosity of so many is helping make this exhibit come alive. And this is just the beginning. More new exhibits will follow as we celebrate our 200th anniversary, including the Hamilton Treasures of the Franklin Institute Gallery and a new bioscience exhibit that not only teaches about how our bodies function, but goes beyond to address wellness, genetics, mental health, health equity, and more. All topics that students tell us are top of mind. We are thankful for all this community has done to support the Franklin Institute. And we ask you to join us in making Mission WOW the tremendous success we know it will be. And now for our final two laureates. Human skin is multifunctional. Billions of cells follow the choreography of genes to protect us and to foster a sense of identity. Likewise, the consequences of genetic disease are often devastating to physical and mental health. To millions suffering, Elaine Fuchs brings hope. From one, many. And from the many, possibility. Nature is a master builder, and one of its most resilient collaborations lies where biology meets the elements. Our skin, billions of cells constantly regenerating, protecting us. And when things go wrong, Elaine Fuchs is there to find out why. Growing up in Illinois, Fuchs explored the fields behind her house with a butterfly net crafted by her mother. There, her passion for science and biomechanics began in witnessing the many metamorphoses around her. Tadpoles to frogs, caterpillars to butterflies. These fields became her first laboratory. But it was much later, as a postdoctoral student watching skin cells endlessly regenerating in a lab at MIT, that Fuchs first wondered about the tiny sets of instructions being passed along from generation to generation. She found her calling. She was going to find the mysterious genetic origins of skin disorders. Sometimes you have that moment in your life where you know that that's what you want to do. You may not know how to do it, but you try enough things in the course of your lifetime that you are no longer afraid of choosing a path that you might not be necessarily trained to do. Back in the late 1970s, genetic research was new. To search for the causes of inherited genetic disease, researchers would study the DNA of large families, combing through dense code looking for differences in gene sequences that could be the clues to the problem. The painstaking process told researchers nothing about how differences in DNA cause disease. And if a disease was rare, there were no large families to study in the first place. Fuchs thought there might be a better way. First, she had to find the DNA encoding critical proteins in skin, called keratins. Then she manipulated those genes in cells and animals to study how they worked. She followed these clues backwards to the human disease. 
I always tell my students that the real goal of graduate school is to learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable because science is not comfortable. Buke succeeded and wound up uncovering the hidden cause of a very rare fatal genetic skin disease called epidermolysis bullosa. It was a watershed moment. Fuchs's reverse genetics techniques transformed the scientific approach to studying the origins of disease. Over the years, Fuchs would go further, unraveling the mysteries of skin stem cells, studying their fascinating ability to shapeshift into different cell types, hair follicles, or the skin barrier, a metamorphosis that, if controlled, could lead to treatments for cancer, burn victims, and even a cure for certain types of blindness. Her work began to change the way dermatologists think about treatment. There's a, a deeper philosophy that really unfolds there because when we think about it, we're really talking about nature and what nature can do. I'm just fascinated with the amazing diversity that she chooses to apply throughout eons of evolution. It's up to us to figure out just a little fraction of what she had in mind. The recipient of the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Life Science, Elaine Fuchs. Ken Frazier's leadership helped push life-saving medication from research labs into the hands of people around the world. And like many others raised in our Philadelphia community, the forward-thinking former CEO of Merck found inspiration here, in this very building. I was born and raised in North Philadelphia, essentially about 20 blocks north of where the Franklin Institute sits right now. So you can imagine for a kid who grew up in the inner city in a narrow row house environment with ambient light all around to go in the planetarium and actually see what the stars look like, to have a sense of the celestial spectrum was really for me just an amazing thing. One of eight siblings raised by a single father on a janitor's salary, Ken Frazier woke up early each morning to catch a bus to school across town. At Masterman, talented inner city kids like Frazier could access high quality education. The school couldn't keep up with him. Frazier managed to graduate two years early, sights set on a military career. I thought I was off to West Point my senior year in high school. I remember the commandant wrote a letter and it said, Dear Mr. Frazier, upon reviewing your record closely, we've discovered that you are 15 years old. So in 1969, Frazier was off to college at just 16, first to study chemistry at Penn State, where he sold tadpoles and newts to local aquarium stores for spending money. And after that, Harvard Law School. The three years I spent at Harvard were formative years. And I came back to Philadelphia to practice in a large Philadelphia law firm, which was only maybe about 20 blocks from where I grew up but was really a completely different world. I was a stranger in a strange land coming back to my hometown and practicing law. While doing casework for global corporations, Frazier donated time to the fight against injustice, once taking up the case of Bo Cochran, a death row inmate wrongly accused of murder. Just 13 days before the scheduled execution, Frazier intervened, proving Cochran's innocence and saving his life. In the 1990s, Frazier accepted an invitation to join Merck Pharmaceuticals, and by 2011, Frazier had risen to become CEO of one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies. As CEO, Frazier doubled down on science and the prospect of long-term gain, both for Merck and patients worldwide. Under Frazier, discoveries nurtured and refined by years of scientific rigor began to come to light. But at the end of the day, when you are able to come through it with that breakthrough, those things really do change the world. And I have seen examples of where people who are suffering, who would not live a long life, are now able to live. Now retired from Merck, Frazier spends his time giving back, working with the organization he co-founded, 110, to help close the opportunity gap for black Americans entering the workforce. 
76% of African Americans at age 30 do not have a four-year college degree. Those people have the drive, they have the desire, they have the skills to work, they just don't have the opportunity. I think what comes across to me more than any particular success I've had is the fact that I feel I was a special recipient of opportunities that other people didn't have. For me, that's what sort of sticks with me and makes me feel obligated as I go forward to ensure that other people have those opportunities. Don't let me forget to say, and I have another connection to the Franklin Institute. I met my wife at the Franklin Institute back in 1985 in that grand rotunda downstairs. I was here for a, a legal event that evening and I was walking out and I met my wife on the stairs and turned around and got to know her and now it's almost 40 years later. So the Franklin Institute also has a really important role in my life. <laughs> The recipient of the Bauer Award for Business Leadership, Kenneth C. Frazier. Ladies and gentlemen, the laureates before us have changed our world, and their stories and work will no doubt ignite imaginations, spark curiosity, and inspire generations to come. Please join me in congratulating the 2023 Franklin Institute laureates. This concludes the award ceremony for the 2023 Franklin Institute Laureates. We now invite you to make your way to dinner in the Institute Galleries. Please reference your ticket to find your dining room and enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night. <laughs>